So what's stratification? So let's say we're doing a randomized trial here. We've got a sample of 20, and we do our block randomization, and, and the groups are equal. But just by chance, we've got 9 out of 10 in this uh, group A that are workers' comp patients. Let's say they're calcaneous fractures or whatever, and they're workers' compensation patients. And in this group, we only have 2 out of 10. And we know that in this small trial, you know, that can happen. You've only got 20 patients. Yeah, you've done your blocks or whatever. You've equalized the groups, but they're not equal with respect to some important variables like workers' comp. So what do we do about that? Well, we can stratify. So let's look at this. And I, I, I should have used a different color for this. It doesn't show up that well. But let's, let's say, okay, we'll, we'll stratify. We'll, we'll separately randomize the workers' comp patients from the other patients. So this is what we do. Uh, workers' comp, treatment A, B. Non-workers' comp, treatment A, B. Is that really stratification? Who thinks that that's good stratification if we just randomize those two groups separately? Simple al uh, allocation here. Are we now stratifying by workers' comp? Come on, guys. Say yes or no. <laughs> yes? Who says yes? We're stratifying. Who says no? We're not stratifying. All right, so just think about it. If this is a simple randomization, you know, this is no different than what we were doing before. You can take the patients and randomize them to treatment A or B, you know, unless, and this is a key point, if you take nothing away from this lecture, this is a key point, unless you're blocking as well as stratifying, there's nothing different about doing this than just randomly allocating people to treatment A and B. Because unless you're ensuring that the proportion of A and B is equal within each group, and that can only be done by blocking, you know, you can still have an unequal number of patients in treatment A. You can have, you know, you can have nine patients in treatment A there and one in treatment B, and the same for non-WSIB. So at the end of the day, you can end up with an unequal distribution. So stratification demands block randomization. And you, you see this violated in some very, um, you know, um, uh, high-profile uh, publications where this was not done. But if you don't block, stratification is, is uh, not really stratification. So it's the same if you don't block a simple randomization without stratification because you can still get an unequal number of A's and B's in each group and therefore lead to uh, a biased uh, sample. So if you block and stratify, that ensures that everything's equally distributed across the treatment groups. So here's what you do. You've got your WSIB patients and your non-WSIB patients, and you've got your blocks so that within each strata, within each strata of WSIB, yes or no, you've got equal numbers of A's and B's. So if you didn't block, again, you could end up with 10 and 2 or 2 and 10 or whatever. You understand that? So, so hopefully that's clear. If you don't block, then stratification hasn't happened. So you must block when you're stratifying. There's no bias. Beg your pardon? Yes, so the idea is that you're blocking. Blocking doesn't introduce bias. It just ensures that as you're accruing patients, there's an equal number that goes into treatment A and B. So superimposing on that blocking, which ensures an equal number going into each treatment group stratification, you're basically doing that process of, of, of equal numbers in treatment A and B for the WSIB and for the non-WSIB patients. Well, the, the, the equalization is random. So again, these blocks are randomly assigned to the patients as they come in. So there's no bias in terms of the random allocation of the patients into uh, treatments A and B. There are potential for problem that I'll, I'll get to in a minute. But the idea of having you know, the WSIB patients equally divided into A and B 
and the non-WSIB patients equally divided into A and B does not introduce any bias. And again, these are random blocks. The blocks are randomly generated, and I've you know, shown blocks of four here for simplicity, but again, we would use variable size blocks, you know, four, six, and, and uh, have that process randomized. So that's a very good question. So let's think about, we're stratifying now by site, okay? We've got four sites, or let's say we've got four strata. We're stratifying by age, gender, uh, weight, height, whatever. But let's look at what could happen. And this is where your point about potential bias comes in. So let's say we're stratifying across four sites. We've got our blocks, you know, we've got our, our different blocks here. So site one recruits their first patient. Just by chance, it happens to be A. Site two, this block happens to be A. Site three, A. Site four, B. Okay, that's fine. You know, after they recruit their 100th patient at each site, you know, it'll all equal out. But what if site one only ever recruits one patient? What if site two ever only recruits one patient? So you can see that if you've got low volume sites, or if this is a low volume strata. So this is the stratum of age less than 50, height above such and such, and female, and whatever. You know what I'm saying? So each strata or each site might be very small in terms of the number of patients in it. And you could end up with a situation where you do have bias. So that uh, there are three A's and one B with these low volume sites or strata. So what's the point? If you're developing strata, really don't have more strata than maybe one or two, right? If you've got 10 strata, each strata is going to be so small that you, you know, will potentially end up with a bias sample. <clears throat> the other thing, if you've got sites, you know, if you've got 10 sites, you might insist on a minimum volume. Say, you know, look, you've got to prove to me that you're going to enter at least 10 patients into the trial or you're out. You know, I'm sorry we can't accept you into the trial. So that's one way of dealing with this issue. So we've talked about simple randomization, which is appropriate for larger trials. We've talked about block randomization. Blocking ensures equal treatment group sizes over time. We've talked about stratification, which must always be used with blocking. And you can stratify by site or surgeon or center. Those are the common things that we usually stratify by or clinical things like age and gender, and be careful of small strata, they get you into trouble. So this is my family on a recent biking trip, and uh, you know, these two have no preference. This guy wants to go there, this guy isn't sure, and this guy wants to go there. So point being, sometimes in a randomized trial, when you know, you approach the patient and you say, well, I've got treatment A, treatment B. They say, I want treatment A. Some say, I want treatment B. And some say, yeah, sure, I, I don't really care. You know, I'll, I'll go into the trial. So what if we were to ask patients, uh, you know, uh, this, this uh, you know, we, we usually, what we do is if they uh, want one treatment or the other, we exclude them from the trial. But what if we included them? What if we randomize those who don't care to treatment A or B, and if you want A, you get treatment A, and if you want B, you get treatment B? What about that? Is that a reasonable thing to do? Well, that's a design that's used in some studies. We haven't used it in orthopedics yet, to the best of my knowledge, what I could find. But the problem is that those that desire a specific treatment usually do better with that treatment. So there's bias involved in this. It does allow you to get larger sample sizes, but it doesn't control the issue of, of bias. So what about if there's a usual care group? And this is kind of an interesting situation that has been used in some orthopedic trials. So let's say the usual practice would be, you know, uh, we've got this new treatment, and uh, you know, if you want to be in the trial, you'll be randomized to new treatment or usual care. If you don't want to be in the trial, you're out of the study. That's the usual way we do things, right? But what if we did this? What if we randomized the patient before we approached them? And uh, so the usual care group, you know, they're randomized to usual care. That's what they would have gotten anyway. And the new treatment group, we say, look, you've been randomly selected for this new treatment. Would you like to have it or uh, would you 
uh, like not to be in the trial. So, you know, if they say yes, then they get the new treatment. If they say no, they get usual care. But, you know, for a variety of reasons, you still have to analyze them by the intention to treat as though they've gotten the new treatment. So this has been used in some trials, and it would be applicable to the situation where you've got a new treatment and usual care. And uh, I think it's an intriguing thing. I haven't had any personal experience with it, but there are ethics boards that have passed this sort of thing. So that's called the Zellin method. And then, of course, at the end of it, you compare these two treatments. The problem is that the usual care group might involve more than usual follow-up. And if you've got a high refusal rate, you know, if you go back and, and everybody refuses a new treatment and you're analyzing them by the intention to treat, you're not going to be able to detect a difference. So there's a high risk of a type 2 error. And, you know, there are issues of, of uh, blinding. You can't really blind the patient. They, they've been told they've got the new treatment. So, you know. All right. The mechanics, and uh, I apologize, we're a little bit over, but the, the randomization schedule has to be secure. It has to be reproducible. You can't just say in your paper, well, you know, I flipped a coin when the patient walked in and that was what assigned them to treatment A or B. It has to be in a reproducible form that somebody else can go and check what you've done has actually been uh, correct. And, you know, I think this group is sophisticated enough to know that we can't use the file number, day of the week, or or anything like that. And of course, and you've talked about this, it needs to be close to the time of treatment. So allocation concealment, you've talked about this before, blinding. What's double dummy? What is double dummy? Somebody, what does that mean? You know, we all know about double blind, but what's double dummy? What does that mean? It's come up in your paper. You'll, you'll be discussing it this afternoon, but I, I think it's an important concept that's worth talking about as a group. Anybody? Double dummy. Let's say that one treatment arm is a pill. The other treatment arm is an injection. How can you blind the patient? One's an injection, one's a pill. How are you going to blind the patient? Sorry? There's That's exactly right. Did everybody hear that? So everybody gets both treatments, but only one of them is active. So everybody gets an injection and a pill, but for those that are randomly assigned to the pill, the injection is a saline injection, the pill is an active pill. For those that are inside to the injection, the injection is the active ingredient, the pill is a placebo pill. Double dummy. Very important when you can't make the two treatments look the same. No way you can make an injection and a pill look the same. Okay. Uh, you know, manual, sequential, sealed uh, envelopes, keep them in one place. They have to be tamper-proof. And, you know, this sequential sealed envelopes is good for a single center, and it can be used in a multi-center, but, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to do everything ahead of time. This is the only thing that I would say you can do yourself in a small trial. You know, your sealed sequential envelopes. Once it gets beyond that, if you're looking at electronics, I would suggest you go to a professional service. And there's lots of professional services that know how to do this. You can even Google it if you like, and there's all kinds of them that will, for a small fee, help you do this. Most universities have this set up already. So just to review quickly, uh, randomization is essential in randomized trials. Simple randomization, we've talked about block randomization, stratification, some new approaches like the Zellin method, and uh, the mechanics, um, uh, which are the, the, the most boring part of randomization. You know, there's, there's lots of, of literature out there and lots of expertise out there, but uh, the do-it-yourself method with sequential envelopes is, is reasonable.